Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our fifth episode of our Listen, Learn, and Act conversations. And we are really fortunate today to have uh, a group of former football student athletes and coaches with us today to talk about their experiences. And one of the things I think is so um, timely about this conversation is we've had a lot of conversations in this LLA environment about current issues around racism and social injustice. And then in the context of Black History Month, we often look back to really um, events in the distant past. And I think uh, one thing that we're really in store for today is really helping us kind of connect, put some context around. This is not a current issue. This did not uh, crop up in our consciousness just uh, in the last six months to a year, nor is it really a conversation about um, the distant history. This is sort of a continuum of issues around racism, social injustice, uh, making the world uh, better and more equitable and more just. Um, and again, that happens on, on a continuum and, and not um, certain, um, there's not an end point um, and necessarily um, only a current event. So uh, with that, I am again, really pleased to introduce uh, Denver Parlor, who will moderate this discussion with some of our really uh, important former Gator football student athletes and coaches, Denver. I appreciate it. Uh, like Linda said, we just have a wealth of experience at the site here from our football program. Just to give you an idea of the, the time frame we're talking about, and my research is correct, we're, uh, they were all with their football program from 1969 through 1978. Coach Carr, obviously, Uh, I'd like to take just a quick moment and let each of them say hello to you, uh, a quick name, where they're joining us from today. Um, I'm going to call on each of you okay, that I see you on my screen. Um, Wayne, would you start us off? Yeah, my name is uh, Wayne Fields from Gainesville, played from 72 to 75. Um, I moved from... Uh, when I moved on campus at the University of Florida, uh, I had to travel probably about a mile and a half. And my home was um, a completely different scenario in moving from um, Gainesville in the city to the University of Florida. It was a major difference in experience that I will never forget. And it helped shape me to be the person I am today. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, Melvin? Melvin, you're mute, muted, Melvin. Melvin, you're muted. Okay, I'm also a graduate of Gainesville High School, and I played with Wayne between uh, uh, 77, I guess 74 and 77. I'm a resident, I was, grew up in Micanopy, so I didn't, I didn't live in Gainesville, but my experience was Real unique. Coach Dickey called me on Wednesday uh, night and invited me to come to spring practice on Monday. On Monday, so that's how I, I got involved with the University of Florida football program. I'm probably one of the first football players to graduate early to participate in spring practice, probably with the worst result. Excellent. Thanks, Melvin. Uh, Nat. Uh, my name is Don, Nat Moore. Um, uh, at least before I came to Florida, my name was Nathaniel, but after I got to Florida, I became Nat. Uh, but uh, I was there in 1972, 73, graduated in 74. And I'm originally from Miami. Uh, uh, after uh, having a, a good career there at the University of Florida, I was drafted by the Miami Dolphins. And uh, um, my beginning all came from what happened while I was there at Florida. And I uh, was able to play for the Dolphins for 13 years. Uh, and I still uh, actually work for him as a uh, senior vice president of special project alumni relations and advisor to the CEO. So my education, as well as my football academy from there at Florida has still, has still taken me to uh, a successful place. So uh, I know that Coach Dickey is on the line. And I, I just want to say thank you to Coach Dickey for believing, not necessarily in me to start, but believing in my basketball coach who had been his baseball teammate that made a call where Coach Dickey gave me a shot. And uh, 
Uh, fortunately, it all worked out. And uh, Mark? Hi, uh, Mark Totten. I uh, live about 45 miles from the Canadian border, back where I grew up. A place called Bay Village, Ohio. I was recruited for football and wrestling to the University of Florida. Um, my experiences uh, over the course of the five years were critical for me to change my ways. And uh, to Coach Dickey, Coach Carr, uh, absolutely both of you uh, contributed to my settling myself down and you know, using what I learned there about teamwork and and uh, you know making myself the middle of everything uh, to be successful today, 65 years later. So. I appreciate being here and appreciate being around all these other guys that are here also. Thanks, Mark. Carlos? Uh, my name is uh, Carlos Alvarez. I'm uh, uh, originally, I was born in Cuba, came to the United States when I was 10 in 1960 with my family after a year and a half after Castro came. I ultimately got recruited to the University of Florida playing football. Um, I played uh, three varsity years. Back then, the uh, you could only play three varsity years, 69 through 71. Two of those years were under Coach Dickey and one year uh, under uh, Coach Ray Graves. Um, I was a wide receiver. Um, I have a great appreciation for Nat Moore, even though I have not, I don't think we've ever met personally, but I remember what a great running back he was at Florida and what a great wide receiver he was for the Dolphins. Um, um, he under he underplayed all of that <laughs> in his little talk, um, and um, I um, after um, I graduated from University of Florida, I went to Duke Law School, graduated, and been a lawyer ever since. And I live in Tallahassee, Florida. Right, thanks, Carlos. Uh, Leonard. My name is Leonard George. I'm from Tampa. I went to Jesuit High School. In 1968, me and Willie Jackson became the first Blacks to sign for a scholarship for the University of Florida. We were signed by uh, then coach Ray Graves, but most of our, mar our varsity years were under Doug Dickey. And so I graduated from the University of Florida in, in journalism and then I went back and got my law degree. And I have a lot of uh, respect for all the people that's been responsible for bringing us along. Thank you. Thanks, Leonard. Alvin? Yes, my name is Alvin Butler. And uh, I played at UF from 1971 to 74. Um, I was probably one of the first black athletes out of North Florida, other than Tampa to sign with UF. And uh, those other guys that went to G Gainesville High School came on my heels, <laughs> just <laughs> let them know that. I, I think Coach Dickey uh, found out that maybe we had some good players in Gainesville. I still live in Gainesville. I have a mental health practice and uh, uh, we are still doing that. And I spend some time at US, UF counseling athletes today. And Carlos, just to let you know, you were the reason I came to UF. I wanted to be able to tackle Alvarez at practice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Alvin. Uh, All right. Wonderful. Thank you, Alvin. Uh, Coach Carr? Yes, uh, my name is Bill Carr, and I was on Coach Dickey's coaching staff from 1970 to the season of 1973. I was one of the first people to meet Nat Moore, when he checked in as a, as a uh, transfer student from community college in Miami, Miami Dade, where he'd played basketball. And uh, since there wasn't, that was before compliance offices existed. And since I was the junior varsity coach that wanted to go into administration, Coach Dickey very graciously allowed me to focus on many of the administrative responsibilities. And uh, I'm still grateful for that. Plus the fact that you allowed me to go to the NAXA convention uh, in one of those years, Doug and I appreciate that tremendously. And we, uh, uh, we worked with every, every one of these young people uh, and uh, they're no longer young, but they are great people. And we appreciate both of those facts for the uh, truth that that represents. Great to be here with you. Wonderful, 
Thank you. And finally, Coach Dickey. Well, I'm Doug Dickey. I, I actually uh, went to high school in uh, Gainesville and went to college at the University of Florida. Graduated uh, there in uh, 1954 and uh, went into the Army and uh, went to the University of Arkansas, uh, to the University of Tennessee, the University of Florida. And I left there and went to Colorado, back to Gainesville for a while and then in the business world for five years and ended up being the athletic director at the University of Tennessee for 18 years. So, uh, uh, but it's a wonderful thing this morning to be sitting here and looking at all these guys that were part of it 50 years ago to think about uh, each of you individually and the things that uh, we were involved in and, and, and we did. It's a, it, it's a wonderful time uh, for us right now, for all of us to be looking at what's going on and the success of the University of Florida and all the good things they have going on. And I see that in other places that I've been, but um, I, uh, I got a Christmas gift from uh, one of my son-in-laws that is the history of American higher education. And in there, it alludes to this period of time from about 1965 to 1975 as being probably the most turbulent time in higher education in America. Uh, from uh, Harvard University in 1636 to the year 2021. It's probably been no more uh, exciting period of time than, than we lived through in those, those period of time from uh, my first uh, signing uh, with Lester McLean at the University of Tennessee he was an African-American uh, in 1967. It was a year before Leonard. So he actually went on the field in 1968. And, uh, my, my, my first experience uh, with uh, in, integrated athletes was when I coached the uh, Fort Carson, Colorado team in 1957. And we had uh, uh, Willie Davis, who went on to be a great player for the Green Bay Packers, was a defensive end for us. And had a guy named Vincent, who was from the University of Iowa, was a running back. And we won the All-Army Championship. And, had uh, uh, probably 20% uh, of a team in the Army was, uh, was, was an integrated football team. So uh, my experience went back a little bit prior to 1967 and 68, but uh, all these experiences of these fellows coming on to the University of Florida campus in the, in the early 70s was a, certainly a terrific uh, change in their, in, in their lives and a change in the status of the University of Florida. covers everyone. Um, and, and let's start going back to that time. Uh, I'm, I'm interested to hear what some of your experiences with racism while you're here at UF, what do you carry from that experience? Um, how has that influenced you throughout your life? Uh, Nat, can you start us off on, on that topic? Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I, when I reflect back and I think about um, coming to the University of Florida and um, you know, the, the race relations and, and how things uh, evolved, um, it wasn't as, I mean, we had our issues, but they were outside the program. They were outside the guys. And for a guy like myself that, you know, I was a part of the integration of high schools back in 1966. I had already experienced that. So I, I had a better handle on how to not lose my cool because when other people have issues with you, it's really their problem. It's not your problem. It's only your problem if you choose to make it your problem. In high school, and, and probably one of the reasons I ended up at Florida in the end, I allowed it to be my problem. I was that guy that wasn't going to put up with any shenanigans. Uh, by the time I got to Florida after playing junior college basketball, and being around so many guys that uh, you know had already been there, had already had already paid the dividends, like uh, Leonard and, and, and Willie, and um, um, uh, there were you know Vince Kendrick. Uh, there were so many guys there, and and then it's about leadership, having the right people in place to deal with the athletes to make sure that they feel respected and that they're part of the program and they're part of winning and, and that they matter. You know, at the University of Florida, we all mattered. Uh, there were no 
issues within the program. There were issues outside the program. You know, I, I remember distinctly, and, and Wayne and AB, you might remember this. At one point, because I was All American or second team All American, whatever it was, uh, my first year, the next year, my pitcher was on the program. And you know, someone stated that they love the they love the Gators, they love the program. They would have bought a whole bunch of programs, but I was on the cover. Well, guess what? That's her problem. <laughs> it ain't mine. So, so if it were as a young man, when I was in high school, I let those things bother me. I learned to live and let live. Everybody has their own views. Uh, and, and that was part of the lesson that I learned there. You know, that only you can take yourself out the game by making a bad mistake of, of reacting to some of those things. Um, um, some of the guys will remember this when we first got there. Uh, there was only one fraternity on campus, uh, Kappa, Kappa I for whatever it is. I didn't join in the way. Um, but the reality of it was we had to find things to do as Blacks on the University of Florida campus. There were really no clubs, no nothing. And if I remember correctly, because I'm, I'm like coach, I'm getting a little old now, but, you know, in the off season, we actually rented um, – um, centers at different apartments, recreation centers. And we threw parties for each other Friday, Saturday night, every, every, every week. We made our own entertainment versus getting caught up in, you know, what's not there. It's not about what's not there. It's about taking advantage of what's there. And that was my experience at the University of Florida. I had a great experience. I, I made lifelong friends, uh, black, white, you know, uh, you, you name it. Um, it's all about you. You know, it's all about adapting. But to me, one of the great things about playing a team sport is you learn to give a little bit more of yourself for the overall good and the success of the organization or the team. And I think when you look at all these guys that we're talking to right now, we learned those things, and in the process, it made us more valuable, more successful life after football because that's what the real world is. It's about perseverance. It's about, you know, staying the course. It's about trusting others to do their job so you can do yours. You, there's no, you know, I, 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 some people ask me the question, who was the greatest quarterback you played with? Well, I, I really don't know. Bob Greasy was a great thinker. Wait a minute. Uh, Dan Marino could throw it like no other. Wait a minute. Chan Gailey was a great thinker. David Bowden was a great passer. Uh, uh, Don Gaffney could do it all. It's not really about individuals. It's about the totality of, of, of the entire team or the unit. And did we win? Because that's the ultimate goal. So when I think of Florida and I think of the, the the racism and all that other stuff, you know what? I dealt with it as a kid. Mm -hmm. And and the sad part is that we're still having some of these issues, that they're now creeping back out. Okay. You know, at some point it was in the closet. Okay. Within the last four years, it's been front and prevalent. And it's up to us as a society to continue to work through these issues and, and, and get back to some kind of normalcy where everybody can enjoy the American dream. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Nat. Appreciate Denver, that. Let me, Denver, let me respond to that right quick. Uh, one thing that uh, he mentioned, uh, there wasn't racism and, and I, did, I never felt like we had any internally with the team either. And I, I do remember one incident where there was a group of uh, black students at the university at done a sit-in at the president's office over some issue. I'm not sure what it was. And and uh, the whole issue came up of people going to walk off the campus and leave. And uh, we were threatened with, uh, you know, were our football players going to leave or not? That was an issue. And uh, he mentioned Vince Kendrick. And Vince Kendrick came into my office. Uh, Vince had come from a family of about 12, I think, in my, Miami. And uh, 
he didn't have much place to go to. And uh, so uh, he came in and he sat down. He said, Coach, I just want you to know that there, there isn't any black football player on this team going anywhere. I got them. Don't worry. <laughs> and so that tells me a great strength of the internal relationships on the football team compared to what was external, as uh, other people have related to here. Thanks, Coach. Uh, Alvin, I know you had some experiences as well. Can you touch on some of that? Yes. Well, I was a Gainesville native, so I grew up watching the University of Florida play football. I was one of the guys that was selling Cokes in the stands on Saturday afternoon. And uh, But as a, as a student in Gainesville, I was also uh, academically fortunate in some respects to be able to uh, have offers from a lot of schools academically. So my initial plan was to go to an Ivy League school. Um, I didn't even play football my junior year in high school. So I had a pretty good senior year and Coach Dickey and the crew came talking and after the All-Star game, I decided to play for Florida. But uh, being a Gainesville native, uh, you know, it made a difference in terms of some of the experiences that I had at UF because you know, I was still home. Uh, one of the things that stands out for me initially though, was that when I was a freshman, there was a freshman team, so we couldn't play varsity ball. But one of the trips that we took with the freshman team was to Auburn, Alabama. And we got off the plane and we got on the bus. And I, I remember I was sitting in, in a seat by myself and we were traveling to the stadium and we passed the field of primarily black people picking cotton in Alabama in 1971. And I thought to myself, what the hell have I gotten into? <laughs> it, was, it was a rude awakening that, you know, there still was some things going on across America and other places that reminded you of days of slavery. And it was, it, was a, um, it, it was a very significant moment for me because I could see that picture in my mind for the next year or two. And, and I can still see it pretty clearly today that there was this schism between me attending the University of Florida and watching this other group of people who probably didn't have the opportunity to even participate in the sort of process that was going on across America, people moving up in their lives. And it, it was, it had a significant impact, um, to, particularly as a, as a freshman and not knowing what to expect, going out of state and, 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 and dealing with people in, in different locations. And, and that stood out for me for a long period. You know, other things, uh, you know, when I was a freshman, uh, my, my sophomore year, we played Mississippi State. We had the occasion to visit Mississippi State. I'd never been to Mississippi before. I heard a lot of things about Mississippi, and I didn't attend college in Mississippi for that reason. But, uh, you know, listening to the cowbells and looking at all the rebel flags, I probably had one of my better games because, you know, I was, I, I was really energized to, to, to be able to to offset any negative opinion that they might have about Blacks as athletes or, or as students. So academically, I wanted to perform well and athletically, I certainly wanted to, to do that as well. Um, but, but those things in terms of, of just some of the comments that, that people would make from the stands and, you know, they weren't great incidents, but they were small incidents of racism that definitely affected a lot of people at an individual level. And those things don't get reported in the news. They don't make highlights, but they make a difference in terms of people's lives. So one of the things that Nat said was resonating for me as well, is that you take that energy that might be negative and coming towards you and you create some positive energy out of it. So because of that, I'm gonna do even better academic. I'm gonna do better athletically just to prove you wrong. So it can be inspirational as well. Thanks, Alvin. Melvin, did you want to comment on that? 
You're on mute. Hey. I think there's a couple of things I'd like to comment on. Number one, Coach Dickey was the right person for the right time. Coach Dickey, uh, I'm not criticizing anyone, you know, Coach Graves, and because Coach Graves actually assigned Leonard and Willie Jackson. In my opinion, Coach Dickey was the person that, as Vince Kendrick would say, you trust Coach Dickey to make the right decisions. Some of his coaches didn't always do that. Trust Coach Dickey to make the right decisions and be there for us. And, and so I think that that's, that's what I'd like to say. I also would like to emphasize the fact that as an athlete, we're isolated. We're isolated in a bubble. We don't, we don't have to deal with a lot of the external racial situations or racism that other students would deal with. And I would like one of the things that one of my classmates told me, they said, well, Melvin, for all these years, you thought there wasn't any racism. racism. They look at your yearbook, and see how integrated Kingsville High School was in 1974. So I think as an athlete, we're isolated. We are treated differently. We're treated special. We have to deal with a lot of the struggles that other African-American students are, are, are dealing with. I think Coach Diggy was a key component in isolating and uh, in, in insulating us from some of the racist practices of like the Mississippi State or the Auburn, Alabama situation. So I, I think I'm thinking for that. Thanks, Melvin. Uh, I'm interested too to hear uh, maybe Mark from your perspective as a white teammate um, at that time. What did what were your observations uh, from from that era? Um, I think my first observation would be going from where I grew up to the University of Florida, how profoundly naive I was uh, about way, the way the world was in some ways. Um, I would agree with Nat's observations and, and, uh, and you know, everybody who spoke to this point in time that the perception of uh, a real problem you know, from a race standpoint at the University of Florida, I did not have that perception. I also had the perception that was shared already too, that when you look at the things that happened from the outside in, we were, I felt prepared, but still naive. I did not have a sense of the, of the problem coming from a background of having started being an amateur wrestler and being with you know, blacks on my team and I practice and all that. I just did not have that perception of, uh, of, 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 you know, of, of the problem. Wasn't raised that way from where I came up from. Ohio. Uh, but, you know, as you get down there and you start to see the undertone, I think the thing that is most erosive about the relationship between people is the stuff that you don't just blatantly see. It's the underlying attitude. It's the point of view. It's the, it's the, it's the prejudgment. And I think those things are the things that really take away from uh, really being able to develop relationships and trusting yourself because you, 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 you really don't know until you've experienced or had somebody share that experience with you to know how hurtful um, and uh, in, impactful uh, comments and, and you know, predispositions to certain things can be. So for me, uh, my experience of, uh, of, of being with uh, you know, black teammates, I mean, they were teammates. They were just happened to be black. So, I mean, I, I, I found the people that I worked with, my great respect for Nat Moore, uh, you know, Wayne Fields. I mean, Melvin Flanoy and I went against each other every single day. We weren't kissing and making up every single day, but I also had some great coaches. I remember Coach Carr, my freshman year, pulled me aside and, you know, made it pretty clear that, you know, I needed to get my priorities in order. But that had nothing to do with race. It had what to do with the development of a young man who, in a way, lived a very sheltered life. Um, and, you know, as I got to know Coach Dickey, clearly I understood why uh, when I talked to my other friends uh, from, from up here where I grew up, who'd gone to other colleges and played sports, to even hear what they went through. I was just, it, it, I would, did not experience that on the University of Florida football team or the University of Florida wrestling team. So, uh, you know, my great honor has been to re be able to reconnect and find the common ground. When you find common ground with people, I think it's important, and I think that uh, you know, never getting into you know, trying to have a discussion in regards to the experience versus a debate. A debate connotates that, that somebody wins and somebody loses. 
I, I, I don't, I think discussion is really important. So I think this forum and this format that we're going through here to share these perspectives, you know, it gives you a little bit more insight uh, to everybody individually and how the collective wisdom has, uh, has, has changed and made us more in tune uh, with where we can have an impact and where we could be a much more empathetic, uh, you know, with, with, with people. So that would be, my, that would be try to sum up my experience without getting too wordy. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate that. Uh, Coach Carr, can you share some of your recollections with us? Well, my, uh, my thought as I look back at, uh, at my time, both as a student athlete and assistant coach and as an administrator, is uh, when it comes to race relations, um, I, I don't feel badly about things I did because I, I have no reason to feel superior to anyone, uh, any kind of supremacy, intellectual, physical, whatever, social, you know, I don't have any room for that, but uh, because I, I'm, I'm not at that level of function and I know that, but the bottom line is I, I feel like I do have a sense of regret for what I didn't do. I feel like I should have taken much more initiative in reaching out to people, being more gracious and being more accepting and demonstrative of my respect. And uh, because I was always, I always had it drilled into me to hey, stay out of controversy. Don't be looking for, don't be looking for center stage. You'll pay a price for that. And I should have been more of a leader in, uh, in reaching out to uh, my minority uh, friends and teammates and classmates, et cetera. Because uh, for example, my high school, my senior year uh, at Pensacola High School was the first year of integration. And we had a very small number of minority students and I should have taken a leadership role, but I thought that the best thing for me to do was just to be low profile and not be involved in that. And that's, I've regretted that ever since that I didn't take a higher profile of connection, of connection and uh, demonstrative respect. Not just respect tacitly, but de demonstrated respect. I should have done that more. Uh, the other thing though, I think that I would say is to move forward to where we are at this moment is that I think we have a prime time right now. And we must, we must as an American nation, as an American people, do a much better job and demonstrate and uh, model to our children and to others that are observing that we are going to do better. We're not gonna lose this moment. I'm excited about the fact that student athletes are banding together and, and demanding a voice at the table of governance, if you will, and operation of athletics programs. And, and in, the, in, the, in the major leagues, you know, whether it's whatever the sport may be, NFL, NBA, you name it. And we can't lose this opportunity. And the one word that I think sums up that is incumbent upon us in intercollegiate athletics in particular to, to have in our hearts and minds and on our, on our lips of expression, how we're describing ourselves is the word empathy. I think that that is a quality that must be demonstrated every day by those who are wearing a whistle or those who are wearing a necktie or a, uh, a suit of leadership in any degree that is that in particular that we must demonstrate empathy for others. And it's gotta be a hallmark of our operation, especially in intercollegiate athletics, given the uh, unique experience that is in our society, at least at this point, if we can, uh, uh, manage to avoid W-2s, if we can just be limited to 1099s and not get to W-2s with how we run intercollegiate athletics, we'll, we'll have a chance to continue that leadership laboratory experience. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Any other thoughts here before we kind of jump on to the next topic? I want to make sure I don't miss anyone. Uh, yeah, I, I'd like to share something. Go ahead, Wayne. Uh, thank you. Um, having to speak after Coach Carr is, um, he's truly one of the intellectuals on this whole panel. 
but um, the experience that I've had here in Gainesville coming through the University of Florida, it, it started with my experience in 1967 when we, my parents who were teachers at the all black high school, Lincoln High School, realized that integration was inevitable and that segregation would not continue. So they put me on a bus to go to a middle school called Howard Bishop. And my dream always had been to go to Lincoln High School, play football for a coach by the name of Jesse Hurd, and play in the band for my father, who was the music teacher, because I loved music and I loved sports as well. But instead, that did not happen. And going to Howard Bishop in 1967, it gave me an opportunity to, to become acclimated on what it was like to go to school with a whole different culture. And for the students, when we first got there and attended Howard Bishop, there were little simple things like, what's the texture of your hair? How does your hair feel? Or why are your lips big? And why does your nose spread out across your face? So getting adjusted to that and then showing that I had just as much intelligence as others in my class because that had to be a proving ground to show that I could count, I could speak, I could read, I could talk, I expressed myself in ways that was just as equal as anyone else. So by the time I finished at Gainesville High School and then enrolled in at the University of Florida, I originally had given a commitment to go to Vanderbilt University. But instead of that, um, something happened to where I said, I need to go to the University of Florida. Coach Dickey and um, their staff had recruited the best athletes, particularly the best athletes in the state of Florida from Miami to Tampa, to Orlando, Jacksonville, Pensacola, and it just worked out to where I gave Coach Dickey and Don Brown, who was the recruiter who recruited me, a call and they said, come to the University of Florida. And I did that and what a great experience. Uh, a couple of guys have said that we were sheltered from racism as far as being on the team. But my very first day in class, the very first day, I was the only African-American in it, a uh, English class and I sat down and said um, to a young lady who was sitting in front of me, I said, hello, my name is Wayne Fields. I play football for the University of Florida. And I'm really enjoying my experience. She turned around and she looked at me and she called me and the N word. And it stunned me at first and it changed my whole perspective. I went from peace, love, because those were the hippie days. And I had spent from the seventh grade to my senior year of being acclimated and, and enjoying my whole experience of an athlete and a student to all of a sudden being looked down upon. And that changed my whole attitude on, you need to prepare yourself because there are going to be some situations and I'd experienced it, but my parents sheltered me back then. I remember when you had Woolworths, you had Sears, you had Wilson's, you had a little hamburger joint called Lewis uh, Hamburgers. And we would have to go to the back door, but I thought that was what was ordinary. That's how it was supposed to be. And as I got older, I then realized that that was because of the color of our skin that we weren't allowed to do that. So my experience when I got to the University of Florida after that confrontation with the co-ed that I would be different and my experience would be different, I all of a sudden had the experience of athletics, which provided me with an opportunity to get to know guys, to get to know teammates. And my very first day as a um, freshman, when I walked into Yon Hall, which was the dormitory area, a guy by the name of Fred Abbott invited me to sit down in his room and get to know him, talk to me. He was the captain of the team. And he told me and shared some experiences that this is not going to be easy for you. When we go to certain places around the SEC, 
you're going to be probably called some names that you aren't going to like. And sure enough, in a game that as a freshman, they allowed us to play, we traveled all together. I don't know how this whole thing worked out, but Coach Dickey, when we went to Ole Miss University, um, he had just about all of the black players on one bus. I don't know if that was by chance or by uh, intent, but uh, the ride when we came into Oxford, Mississippi, they threw eggs at us. They threw different things at the bus. When we walked onto the field, we noticed that all of the black employees sat on the field in the bleachers. And once the game started, we realized that this was a different type of scenario. We were called the N-word time after time after time again. Unfortunately, that didn't um, sit well with the players on the team because we ended up beating Ole Miss 16 to nothing at their homecoming. But it was a part of the mature, the, the maturation of what we had to go to, through. And none of the guys have mentioned that during that time, that did mention that we got together, rented a facility that um, mainly catered to the black players, but we came together to try and overcome some things that uh, we knew would be difficult. Social life, um, as far as making sure that we all did things together. But the other thing that we did is we started an organization called the Union of Black Athletes, UBA. Coach Dickey is aware of that, Nat, Alvin, Melvin. And UBA was formed to make sure that not only did we get recognition from playing on the field, but we also helped each other in the classroom. We found tutors. We made sure that the guys, once they went from their freshman and sophomore year, that they would be able to make the transition to their junior and senior year going into their major. And because of the isolation of what we would go through in the classroom, as far as, as, as special programs that they had, the group Yuba made it so that we would all come out graduate, stay eligible in our playing time. And those guys went on um, to be corporate leaders, uh, assistant general managers of the NFL teams, doctors, lawyers, politicians, entrepreneurs. So the experience was very positive. But at the same time, there were some things that we went through that let us know that people didn't always play fair. I would be nice. So that was my experience. And I just am uh, very happy that you all are discussing this, talking about this, bringing it to the forefront. Thank you so much for sharing that, Wayne. Carlos, I think you had something to say there as well. Um, not as good as Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> Wayne, that was a, it was a, it was hard to hear, but wonderful to hear. And I hope you know what I mean by that. Yes. Um, you know, I uh, really a lot of good thoughts, uh, thoughts here. Uh, somebody who said they, they felt they could have done more. Uh, I think that that is a lesson for the future about the urgency of the situation. Um, back, uh, just to give you a perspective that I think the, uh, uh, the, the, the African American players here, um, so you can see what they went through is, uh, you know, 69, 70, 71, the number of uh, African-American students in the student body of University of Florida, we're talking about less than 200 in a student population of the uh, 14, 15,000. And that's, you know, over, over 10 years, 15 years after Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, saying that that is not the proper thing, that, you know, separate but equal uh, does not, uh, is not, is unconstitutional. unconstitutional. So they're working in an atmosphere where there is about 200 of all, that's all of the black students at University of Florida facing, uh, you know, facing a situation is that, you know, it looks monumental, really. Um, and then of course they have to face uh, um, other obstacles as they go to even darker places uh, in the SEC. I will tell you that I, even at Florida Field, uh, and this was a story told to me by a great uh, wide receiver for Houston, Elmore Wright. Him and I uh, 
uh, had an occasion together uh, uh, about a year later after we played Houston at Florida Field in my in my uh, sophomore year. Um, and uh, Elmo, again, a great wide receiver, ended up playing for the pros. Um, he said, and that was, uh, we played Houston the first game of the year uh, that year. And, he, and Houston happened to have a number of African-American players when they came to Florida Field. And a lot of Florida fans were not used to it. Um, and when they came on the field, the N-word was repeated over and over again. And he said, to some extent, some of the African-American players got a bit intimidated. And it just shocked me. Now, I never heard the words, um, but uh, I believe Elmo right when he said it. And it certainly doesn't mean that uh, the vast majority of the, the Florida fans did that because it was not. It was just a few, you know, a few, uh, you know, people that uh, chose hate uh, at that moment in time when really it should have been a celebration of, of uh, uh, athletes playing football. So that's the kind of atmosphere, that's the kind of situation that the African-American players uh, faced at the time. And I tell one story that I think maybe highlights, at least for me, what it was like. Um, I was a Cuban. I was not an American citizen when I got recruited at University of Florida. Um, and so I ended up my, uh, my sophomore year um, becoming uh, an All-American and having all the great benefits that has. At the same time, when I got recruited and when I became an, uh, an All-American, um, we did, that was the last white, that was 1969, that was the last all-white football team at University of Florida. A number of great athletes, and I'll just mention one because a lot of people won't remember, but people like Bob Hayes, who, you know, coined the term the world's fastest human, who played for Florida A&M, would have had the opportunity to play at Florida, but they were black, so they didn't have the opportunity to play at Florida. But I, a Cuban citizen, got the opportunity to play at Florida while African Americans were dying in Vietnam, fighting for our country. That's how bad things were. I really, that's how bad things were. And this is, you know, over a hundred years after the civil war, over 15 years uh, after uh, Brown versus Board of Education. So it was an, an uphill struggle. And for me to come from Miami and see things in bathrooms like colored bathrooms or black only bathrooms, white only bathrooms was shocking. Um, and uh, really, all the black athletes, and for me, Leonard and Willie, uh, Leonard George and Willie Jackson, because they were the first African Americans, the ones I got to know better. Um, people like Vince Kendrick that came later, uh, they're heroes in my in my book, uh, and all the African Americans that are in this call, uh, in this Zoom call, they're all heroes, um, true heroes, and hopefully they'll be recognized that way going into the future. Incredible. Thanks so much, Carlos. Uh, Coach Dickey, can we follow up with you to share some of your experiences? Uh, well, I, I think that uh, they have mentioned some historical points in time, 1954 and, and uh, the, the, the Brown decision. And here we are in 1970, some of us sitting in chairs of responsibility, uh, the buck stops with you. And uh, I, I always felt like as a football coach, it was my responsibility recruiting athletes to come to universities, whether it was at Arkansas or whether it was at Tennessee or at the University of Florida. The, the responsibility of the head coach is to see to it that you maximize the performance of an individual through his career, that he becomes all the athlete you could hope for him to be and he becomes all the person you hope it could be through his academic in, in involvement at the institution. So we've tried, I think, over the period of time there, Bill came in to head up our academic support system. We had people doing weightlifting for the first time in 1970. We had never seen any of that. 
before in, in colleges. And so now we're building strength, we're building character, and we're building uh, in, uh, integrated football teams. And so your job is to, to manage the circumstances that you happen to be a part of at a given moment. And uh, that's where I found myself. And uh, to the benefit of all of these young men, they were terrific, all of them, even Carlos with all of his stuff that he had to be part of and agitations of one kind or another that went on during that period of time. <laughs> he found something to be part of in protest. And so protests have been part of the college environment for years and years and years. And it's never stopped, really. And a lot of the protests around the world come off of college campuses and into issues. And so people uh, with uh, very active minds and people with very active interest in, in, in having a better life for whoever they're involved with or come from college campuses. And we happen to be at that moment, uh, you know, I moved to Gainesville in 1970 to take the head coaching job. And uh, by the fall of 1970, the Alachua County was in the Supreme Court decision that threw out the separate but equal. So all of a sudden, Wayne uh, probably came over to Gainesville High School, uh, along with my children, were in, in Gainesville High School, and we went to a double shift. They closed Lincoln High School. And all of a sudden, we have an integrated high school in Gainesville. Uh, and now we have an integrated football team at the University of Florida. So this is a, a, an extremely sensitive moment in time, but uh, we all managed it. And I look today at these folks, and I don't see uh, any of us that are any worse off. We're certainly a whole lot better off in so many ways, and we've come down the road of 50 years now. Uh, at that moment in time, we were a little over 100 years from the Civil War, but five generations had gone to various levels of non-integrated schools, and now all of a sudden, uh, this is a moment in time where we integrate all of the schools uh, across the country. So I'm proud to have been part of that. And I'm very happy to, I think, made some solid contribution to the management of those circumstances. And um, it was wonderful to see all these guys today. Thank you so much, Coach Tiki. Uh, could, me... I, could, I ask, could, could I ask one question of, sure. of Coach Dickey? Because I've never heard him talk about this, but Coach Dickey, when you, you came to Florida and you opening up really, uh, you know, players African American, how much of a pushback did you get back on that from well, we alumni got or anybody else? Oh yeah, we got some. I had some letters from mm -hmm. the Ku Klux Klan. I didn't. Most of it came from West Florida, and uh, a little bit of it out of the Jacksonville area. Uh, but uh, yeah, there was some pushback from it. If you can remember, we had Dickie's Darkies uh, were part of the things that came down, and, huh. you know. And uh, so those are things you put up with. And uh, but that kind of stuff was out there, and people did it. But it was very small, Carlos. And and you put it aside and said, you know, this is not leadership in our country. These are from people who are just crying in the in the spitting in the wind, you know. So we're 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 bigger than all of that. And it was a moment in time where we had to take a position that was in the, what was the right position to move forward. And it was nothing of I, of, I considered any significance. I, I did have some of my ex teammates from the fifties and the late forties and fifties at Florida who were part of the, hey, what are you doing down there? You know, where are you going with this? Uh, what, what kind of numbers are you looking at here? You know, that kind of thing. And, so uh, the idea was that uh, you're going to get the best athletes. Uh, uh, one of the things we had an issue with, you remember, was getting people qualified academically, that we had more athletes than we had academics. So the university put together a program there, and I can't remember what the name of that was, but I remember the guy that ran it came from the University of Nebraska. And he told me one time, he said, Coach, now I'm from Nebraska. I know what it takes to make this work for you here, you know. So uh, I didn't know the man. And I didn't know what he was doing exactly. But uh, they had a program where you can take a course. And if you failed it, you didn't get any degree. If you made Equal a degree, Education degree. Opportunity Program, EOP. Yeah, that's right. Whatever they call it. And, and so we had some people who successfully got along and got to the other end of their academic world by going into that program and 
you know, people didn't read well. They had to, we had reading uh, that you had to take care of. There are people who had come out of uh, non-integrated high schools that came to the University of Florida were not prepared for the academic challenges that we had. So it did help them. And uh, I think they, that, and that lasted, what, five or six years, maybe something like that until integration in the high schools had produced enough people who academically could handle the entrance requirements of the University of Florida. Dr. Henry Pennypacker was his name. Henry Pennypacker from, from Nebraska. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there we go. I want to make sure we have a chance to hear also from Leonard, who, along with Willie Jackson, was one of uh, the first black football players here at the University of Florida. Leonard, what can you share with us from, from, from your experience and perhaps maybe even what was unique about your particular experience? Well, the main thing is that uh, we were the first ones, but mm -hmm. not really, because uh, before us, we were the first football players, but before us, you know, in 1968 was Ron Coleman and Johnny Brown. They were already there, you know, as part of the track team. So we, in that sense, uh, we uh, really, uh, um, you know, went on to their uh, soldiers as well, because uh, not only that, because in 1960, I mean, 1958 was when they start first uh, admitting the black students in Florida, period. Not just, you know, of course, we were the first uh, athletes, but, you know, it was only 10 years before that they had any black students in the University of Florida. So that was only... 10 years uh, later. And at the time uh, when we came to that, it's the same thing. We, when we, uh, me and Willie Stein in 1968, uh, look what happened in 19, in, the, in, de in December, it was only eight months, you know, in April in 1968, when Dr. Uh, King was assassinated. So this was very, you know, difficult time. This was in the middle of things that was going on. So we were uh, at the beginning of it. And so, like they were saying before, we had each other and we had the team. So I got to say that, you know, we had, uh, you know, Coach Dickey uh, did a good job with understanding where we were coming from and having all the issues we had to, to deal with. We had to try to make the team. That was our main uh, focus. Plus we had the academics. Plus we had all the social uh, issues. I was a part of that meeting uh, where Diggy talked about that we had, when we had that uh, uh, threading, uh, uh, our, uh, walk out in 1971 I was part of that meeting and all the team met and we were discussing it and at that time I was saying that well it looks like we're going to have to leave or we're going to have to have to you know uh, certainly considering it because but they the teammates that we had at that time, including Carlos, John Reeves, and all those guys, they were very uh, supportive. They say as well, look, we can understand, we want you to stay, but we understand that if you have to leave, we understand why. So we were caught between these two worlds, you know, uh, three worlds really, because being uh, uh, one of the students but one of the first uh, black athletes, that was uh, something to deal with. So me and Willie had to deal with that at that time, but we also had uh, Vince and uh, Lenny Lucas and all of those people that had come. And so we were part of it at that time. So I would say that, yeah, it was, uh, it was tough for us, but I would say that we never had a problem with our own uh, uh, team. We never had a problem 
with our coaches. Mike, uh, because at one point we were saying, is this uh, ra uh, uh, racism? Because it looked like the coaches were picking us out to have to do uh, you know, extra work, having to run the stadium. Uh, coming to our, <laughs> to our dorm room and okay, look, you got to get out there now. We're saying, uh, is this racial or what? I mean, this is where the two black guys got to do more work than anybody else. But I was saying that to say that they didn't give us any break because, you know, they considered us, you know, a part of the team and they were not going to give us any breaks. That was that was for sure. So me and Willie was saying, man, we got to, you know, run these stadiums again. Oh, no. What have we done now? If we were late to a meeting, they were saying, well, OK, you're black. Uh, you, it's, it's all right. Uh, you know, well, we understand. Nope, we had to do everything that everybody else do. And I think more of it after that. So uh, that experience made it, uh, you know, tougher because we had to answer to them. And so that made it very, you know, uh, unusual because we had a lot of things to do with. Those, those extra stadium steps probably didn't help you as an athlete, but they made you want to go to law school and get something different. <laughs> That's right. I say, I got to find a way to get out of this thing. So law school seemed like that was the best option. Leonard is too modest to say this, but he and Willie graduated from school on the same day. They were a class of like 20 or 30 players, and only nine of them graduated the, the, the four years of, of, of eligibility. Uh, that was a very unique class that, that Willie and, and Leonard were in. The fact that they were two of nine students that graduated from school in their class is amazing. So, so they were both talented athletes and talented uh, academic students too. Wow, that's incredible. I wanna thank you all so much, uh, you know, we could talk all afternoon here, but I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, Can I say one more thing? Yeah. Uh, number four is important. I know you. Yes, I want. That. I want to get to that. Oh, you want to get to that? Okay, good. Yes, yes. So even though we're not going to get to every topic, I do want to touch on you, you know that the action part. You know, once you know, you need to take some action. One of the things that that, that you all have done is uh, create an endowment in Leonard George and Willie Jackson's names. And I just wonder briefly, you know, Wayne, Melvin, a couple of you could uh, just touch on how and why that came to be and, and educate us on that, Wayne? Well, the reason that we wanted to bring the attention of the very first two African-American athletes was to bring recognition to our time period. Of course, we didn't win a championship, didn't win an SEC, we came close, right, coach? but at least we did um, compete, broke some ground. And so we wanted to do that, but we wanted to also recognize the fact of, of what it meant to have Leonard and Willie here. Coach Dickey, I read in a um, biography of Gator football written by Tom McEwen um, that Coach Dickey gave an order to his assistant coaches to go out and recruit the best athletes in the state of Florida that they could get. And also he made light of, get me the best black athletes that are out there as well. And he had to take a big hit. Melvin mentioned that, you know, we are so ever uh, always thankful and we're grateful that Coach Dickey made that initiative and took that and made the effort to get the African-American athlete here. And so we want to thank him. And that's also a part of the Willie Jackson, Leonard George endowment. So that we're helping to provide um, a scholarship in the name of these two guys. And so that's my initiative, that's my reason. And um, I think it's very worthwhile. I think we might, we might mention there, Wayne, that I think the university gave us a commitment from at least from the um, uh, person in the Gator Booster Office that was helping manage that, that that particular scholarship would be awarded each spring to an athlete for his senior year. 
who would carry the banner of that particular naming and it would be somebody who is a standard setter of some sort on the football team, both academically and athletically, since both of those uh, people graduated from the university. And so to set a banner for that, uh, it's not that it's an additional scholarship. It's just one of the 85 or whatever the number is on football now. And it would be awarded uh, as an honor to that person. So I hope they go through with that. I, I felt like that was a very important part of it if we could get that done. So. And the, the way you can participate in this tribute to uh, Leonard and Willie as the first African-American scholarship football players at the University of Florida, you can call Garrett who's in this office. The number is 352-692-6023. Again, 352-692-6023. And no contribution is too small are too large. Uh, we definitely need large contributions as well as the small ones. So call Garrett and, and, and make your contribution. And if you do contribute, what we're hoping to do is have everyone who contribute name on a plaque or, or, or some kind of recognition uh, acknowledgement. We really would like to have all of the people who have been involved with the University of Florida Athletics, particularly the football team, participate in that. Wayne, you got anything else? Dude. Um, Coach Dickey, you mentioned um, that during the time when in 1967, I think it was, and Carlos, you alluded to this as well, that the students at the University of Florida um, had a sit-in. They took President O'Connell's office over and some of them went to jail. That demonstration and that sit-in was led by Judge Stephen Mickle. He was one of those students uh, that actually participated in that walk-in and, and a sit-in in, in, in addition to that. But he recently passed a couple of years ago and that's Judge Stephen Mickle. And when you look at why they actually walked and why they demonstrated. Look at those issues. Those issues was about curriculum. It was about hiring. It was about the leadership and the administration of the University of Florida did not reflect on them. They were different. It was back in the 60s, of course, and there was a lot of transition going on. And if this webinar that we're holding today needs to look at that, and that saying that is you look at and reflect on your past to make sure you do not make the same mistakes in the future or even in the present. And so if you look at what they marched for, look that up, um, find out what were their demands and make sure that the administration, University of Florida, does not make the same mistakes that those students were asking for, for a change to make a difference. Absolutely, thank you so much, Wayne. Denver, this is Alvin Bala. Yeah. I wanna say one more thing. Sure. As I've listened to conversations today and I've heard a lot about Coach Dickey and it was clear to me that I would have never come to the University of Florida had it not been for Coach Dickey. I was a native Gainesville person and I did not want to play under Ray Graves. So I think Coach Dickey's presence was instrumental for my decision to come to Gainesville. There were certainly other people who spoke in the day about how Coach Dickey endured some harassment because of his recruitment of black athletes. And, and I certainly want to just acknowledge to him that I'm appreciative of the effort that he made to allow black athletes to come to the University of Florida. There certainly were things outside of school. I mean, I was once accosted on University Avenue in Northwest Sixth Street by an angry white man on the Friday nights with a pistol while I was waiting, waiting at a red light. And he stopped me merely because I was a black person driving in the lane next to him. That sort of isolated incident is kind of how racism 
uh, happens all the time on a daily basis, but that never gets written about in the newspapers. It never gets broadcast. And I don't think the other side of that gets broadcast either. The efforts that Coach Dickey made to allow us to attend UF and not have any issues with racism, particularly that kind of blatant racism that we've seen in our society. So I, I wanna thank you, Coach Dickey, for the effort and the things that you had to endure to make that happen. Uh, thank you, Alvin. I appreciate that. I, I'll share one other little story with you. Uh, that in uh, the summer of, um, I guess it would be in, in 1950, the summer of 1950, I finished high school and uh, I was working for the grounds department, the University of Florida. And uh, I spent about a, a, a week uh, been assigned to a fellow named name of Charles, who was a black kid from Gainesville, who was a little older than me, He'd probably seven or eight years older than me and uh, he and I got assigned a job of building a culvert uh, so they get poor concrete and water runoff and I spent a week in the ditch there with him digging and building and so forth and we talked a lot he'd been against a uh, Lincoln High School athlete and I was going to the University of Florida to walk on and be a, a football basketball baseball player whatever and he wasn't going anywhere he didn't have a chance. He said it came along. He never had a chance to do anything. He would have had to have gone off somewhere and he didn't have any money to do that with. And here he was working for the, the grounds department. He was a nice guy. He was a, he was a very intelligent man. And uh, uh, I hope he did something well with himself for the rest of life. I lost track of him. But that made a real influence on me that I had a chance to go do something and I'm standing in a dish with a shovel in my hand he's got a shovel in his hand and I got a chance to do something and he doesn't and that always left an impression on me that I needed to do as much as I could for as many people as I could for as often as I could so I hope that uh, that's where we believe that that uh, it, it was an opportunity in in the 70s to create a better life for a whole lot of people. I hope we did. Well, Dickie, I want to say thank you too. I also want to say there are a lot of other Coach Dickies. There, there are one of the things that keeps, because you know, I think when kids, look, when young people look at this, this video webinar and they say, we've been talking about racism, we've been talking about some bad things, and some good things. I think mean, it's one of the good things. But there are more good people in this world than there are bad people. Definitely as an African-American growing up in a segregated world for a period of time, that is something that, that I have always focused on. There are definitely a lot more good white people in the world than there were bad white people. And, and, and so I, I do appreciate those Dickey, but there are also, I think, one of the things. Thank you, guys. Only there are Coach Dickey's, but there are other people, too. They're doing great work. Including Coach okay. Carter and some other people. Yeah, go ahead, Matt. Um, you know, after listening to everything that we've uh, said here today, um, um, I think there's several accolades that need to be given out, and 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 we've done it uh, uh, with Coach Dickey having the courage and the fortitude to uh, make that jump and and give black athletes a chance to come to the University of Florida and and showcase uh, their talents and, 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 and gain an education. But I still believe that the two people that really need, uh, I mean, everybody deserves credit, but the two guys that really need to be applauded is Leonard George and Willie Jackson for going there, proving Coach Dickey right, proving that athletes can come to school there, black athletes can come to school there, perform and, not just on the football field, but in the classroom. And the thing that I marvel at, because when I got there, I'm already ready to play, you know, all up. but they had to go there for a year and couldn't play. There were no freshman team. There were no allies. I mean, they had to suck it up and become those guys that became part of the team, uh, build that roadway that we all followed. And, I'm telling you, I know how tough it is when you're the first group coming in. I went through it in high school. And for Leonard and Willie to deal with it and accept it and excel versus balling up their fists and fighting, 
it says a lot about the individuals. And we all owe them homage for being the first to create that path that we followed. And Coach Dickey, um, I mean, you get a lot of accolades, you deserve each and every one of them. Um, and I, 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 uh, I heard you say something earlier about in 1970, that became weights. And I remember you and I had that conversation. Um, <laughs> As a breakaway running back, <laughs> you told me that I need to get in the weight room <laughs> stronger. And I looked at you and I said, Coach, the football only weighed 13 ounces. That's the only thing I'm <laughs> Now, years later, in the NFL, after I got broken up and beat up, I wish I had gotten in the weight room. <laughs> 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 you know, I, I didn't take you by, but we had Adrian Burke, who was a great quarterback for the Philadelphia Eagles for a while. He was he came down for about my sophomore year in college, and he was there for spring practice. And I was walking in one day with him, and he said, you know, he said, you're a pretty good player, but you need to go get in the weight room somewhere and get some strength built up on you. I said, yeah, that's crazy. The only weightlifters over Daytona Beach laying around on the store <laughs> over there. You know? Listen to girls. I'm not going to weight room. I got other things to do, you know. So, uh -huh. <laughs> but times change and everybody oh, yeah. gets bigger and stronger. So thank you, Nat. That's good, yeah. Well, I just want to say thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Uh, you know, we are so beyond grateful for, for your time, your insight. Every, everything you've shared with us, everything that you've done for this place, um, you know, it's, it's just fantastic. And we're all the better for, for having spent this time with you, you all and hearing your experiences and, um, and particularly even, uh, you know, hearing directly from, from Leonard and from, um, you know, our last conversation was about allyship um, among our, 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 the white folks here and just hearing what coach Dickey has done is, is just, you know, as a trailblazer in that path is, is, is incredibly helpful as well. I just want to say, say, say again, thank you all so much. We appreciate your time and we hope you all have a great day. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great to see all you guys. I really enjoyed it.